We've all experienced in one way or another the death of someone we've loved. And how we react in that moment and how we feel in that moment of the death of a loved one is determined by a lot of different things. What was our relation to that person? Was that person a parent, a child, a coworker, a friend, a spouse? How old were they when they passed? How did they die? What kind of life did they live? What was the quality of my relationship with that person? Did I get a chance to say goodbye and make things right before they died? Did we know that moment was coming or did that come as a total shock? Like all of these things impact the way we feel and the way we react when someone who is near and dear to us passes away. So imagine for a moment what it was like for the disciples, those close to Jesus when he died. He was crucified. He was nailed to a cross. A horrible, torturous death unfairly accused, unfairly sentenced to death. He had done nothing wrong. And with that moment, Jesus' death, the disciples' hopes and dreams died with him. They thought he was the Messiah, that he'd be ushering in the kingdom, that he'd finally be kicking out Rome once and for all that he'd reestablish Israel as a nation of prominence, but, but now he's dead. And with his death go their hopes and dreams. On top of that, those closest to him betrayed him, denied him, scattered and fled in his final moments. All of them wrestling with grief, sorrow, despair, disillusionment, helplessness, hopelessness. Jesus was dead, and he now laid in a borrowed tomb. And the darkness of that sealed tomb now matched by the darkness of their dashed hopes. Some of you here this morning are struggling with those exact same things. Grief, despair, disillusionment, a feeling of helplessness, a feeling of hopelessness. That is exactly the way Jesus' disciples felt in the days following his death. They were dark days. The women, they went to the tomb <clears throat> where Jesus was buried to anoint him with spices. See, they didn't embalm people like we do today or like the Egyptians even did back in the day. So what they would do is they would come with spices to cover the stench of a decaying body. And that was considered like an act of love toward that person. So, so the women are coming to offer Jesus one final act of their love. <clears throat> but the tomb had a stone in front of it a large stone that was sealed. So it makes sense when we read this in Mark chapter 16, verses 2 and 3. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? Like that was a legitimate question. Who will roll the stone away so that they can anoint the body? Because they certainly are not going to be able to do it. So the question that they're asking here is very factual in nature. Like it's a real legitimate problem. Like who is going to roll this stone away that we can do what we came to do and show Jesus one final act of love? But, but with that question is really an expression of the hopelessness that they feel in this entire situation. Implied in their words here are feelings of grief, and sorrow, and hopelessness. Really what they're saying here is Jesus is dead. Jesus is buried. And we can't even anoint him 
because of the rock in front of the tomb. Like there's really nothing we can do anymore. It's over. Hopeless and helpless. But what they don't realize is that in that moment, a new day is dawning. Literally and figuratively. As the sun rises on the first day of the week, there is hope. We go on to read this in verse 4. Uh, but when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. The scripture is very clear about this. It was God who rolled the stone away. But God did not roll the stone away so that Jesus could get out. God rolled the stone away so that people could get in and see for themselves what was and what was not there. It was rolled away so that people could bear witness to what happened inside. God is in the business of moving rocks and restoring hope. The women looked up at the rock and saw it moved, and they're shocked. They are moved. <laughs> they're surprised. And, and now with that rock moved, they can go inside. And so we read this in verses 5 and 6. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? Like upon entering the tomb, the angel's first words to them were words that brought calm, were words that bring peace. He said, do not be alarmed. Do not be afraid. Which, to be honest, would be the exact words I would want to personally hear when I enter any tomb, right? If I go into a tomb, I'm a little alarmed. I'm a little afraid. If I go into a tomb and there's an angel sitting there, I am more alarmed. I am more afraid. But the first thing the angel says, think about this, in the midst of a tomb are words of peace, words of comfort. Do not be alarmed. Do not be afraid. Jesus, the one you are looking for, the one you are mourning, the one who was crucified, the one who was nailed to a cross, he is not here. He's risen. And he has gone on before you, just as he said he would, to meet you in Galilee. Go look for yourselves at the place where they laid him. Jesus had risen from the dead, just as he said he would. And it is the resurrection of Jesus that proves once and for all that Jesus is who he claimed to be, the Son of God, the Messiah, God in the flesh. All of Jesus' claims hinge on this. Jesus' resurrection is the evidence that Jesus is indeed who he said he was. The empty tomb is the first evidence of his resurrection. The resurrection is the evidence that Jesus is who he claimed to be. So this tomb that was once a place of grief has now become a place of joy. The tomb has become a place of hope. The tomb has become a place of peace. This tomb that was once a place of death has been transformed into a place of life. This tomb that was once the symbol of defeat is now a symbol of victory. Think about it for a minute. A, a tomb. Up until this moment, a tomb is a symbol of loss. A tomb is a symbol of defeat. It's where all hopes and dreams go to die. They're buried. But God rolled the stone away. And now that same tomb becomes a symbol of victory because it's where Jesus conquered death. It's where Jesus rose from the dead. It's as we sang earlier, it, God is in the business of turning graves into gardens, of bringing life into places of death. God has a way of bringing victory from defeat. Think about the cross. The cross was a symbol of loss. The cross was a symbol of defeat. The cross was a symbol of a place of torture and torment. It's where hopes died. But now because of Jesus and the resurrection, the cross now becomes a symbol of victory 
Because that's where sin was conquered, and the tomb now becomes a symbol of victory because that's where life was restored. And both the cross and the tomb now become symbols of the power of God and the love of God, a place of victory. The cross and a tomb, victory over sin, victory over death. And if God can take a cross and a tomb and turn those into places of victory, what might he be able to do with your life? If God can take a place of death and torture, a cross and a tomb, and if God can transform that into a place of victory and hope, just imagine what he could do in your life, regardless of how defeated you are, regardless of how defeated you feel, regardless of how hopeful, hopeless you may be, regardless of whatever situation or circumstances you might find yourself in. God can move a rock and bring forth life. He proved it once and for all on this day. God can bring forth life in the craziest of places. God can bring forth victory. He proved it once and for all. The cross is the place where Jesus paid for our sin. The tomb is the place where Jesus conquered death once and for all. And both of these things bring us hope. Imagine that. Hope from a cross. Hope from a tomb. Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, mercy, not getting what we do deserve, which is death. In his great mercy, instead of death, what he's given us is new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fate. Jesus' death pays for our sins. His resurrection means that if we have put our faith and trust in his work and the price that he paid on the cross on our behalf, then we too can look forward to a resurrection so that the grave is no longer a place of defeat and a place of loss. It now becomes a place of hope. It now becomes a place of victory because we know that the grave is not the end for those of us who've put our hope in Christ Jesus. It is the evidence of the power and love of God. But it's not just hope for the future. It brings hope now. Look again at what Peter is saying here. He says this is a living hope that comes through us through the resurrection of Jesus. Through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, you just don't have hope. You have what Peter calls a living hope because you have a living Savior. You have a Savior who conquered death. And that reality brings hope not just for the future, it brings hope now. And it doesn't just bring hope now, it brings hope for the future. Like the eternal hope that we have because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead changes how we live now. That's what makes it living hope. It affects the way we live. It affects the way we think. It affects the way we act. It affects the way we speak. It affects the way we treat others. It affects the way we look at our circumstances, the way we deal with hard times, the way we walk through struggles. In Christ, it's a hope that is alive. It is a living and breathing hope because we have a living Savior. It brings us life, new life, life eternal and life abundant. That gives us hope for the future, and it should give us hope now. The resurrection of Jesus brings me a living hope, because now I can live in confident expectation, because God raised Jesus from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus proves once and for all, Jesus is who he says he was. And if he is who he says he was, then that means all of his promises are true. And if all of his promises are true, then I can bank on him. And then I can live a life filled with tremendous hope because I can live this life in confident expectation that all of, other, all of God's other promises will come true as well. So I can live differently now because of the resurrection of Jesus. It gives me confident expectation that all of the rest of God's promises will come true as well. That changes the way I live. If Jesus has conquered death and I am in him, then death has lost its grip on me. And that's the good news. 
The eternal life that Jesus has secured for us through his life and death and resurrection not only gives us hope for the next life, but for this one too, because it is the evidence of God's faithfulness and it is the evidence of God's goodness. And now I can walk confidently in God's faithfulness and God's goodness. But understand that the women in that moment at the tomb, like they have no idea of any of this, right? They can't comprehend all this. They're coming to grips with just, with just what they walked into. They thought everything was going to be one way and then everything flipped and went another. And then they went to the tomb expecting everything to be one way and then everything flipped and went another. And they're just trying to, trying to process all this, right? They're just trying to come to grips with all of this. They were expecting one thing. Now they're getting something else. They went to anoint a dead Savior and all of a sudden the game has changed. And all they have to go on in this moment is what the angel just revealed to them, which was a lot to swallow, <laughs> and to go by what they see and what they don't see before them. And the angel then says to them these words in verse 7 of chapter 16, but go and tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. The angel implores them, I've given you this good news, now go. Go and tell Peter. Go and tell the disciples. Go and tell them that Jesus is alive and that he is going on ahead to meet them just as he said he would. That's the first commission we see in Scripture of, of that great commission to go out and tell people the good news that Jesus is alive. How exciting! But look at how the ladies respond in verse 8. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is why I love Scripture, <laughs> because it, like, doesn't sugarcoat anything. Like, they have just gotten the most incredible news you could possibly have, and they're told to go spread that and share that with others, and what do they do? They run and hide, and they don't tell anybody because they're afraid. The women ran out of the tomb and said nothing. They were given unprecedented, unbelievable news, but yet we're told they said nothing because they were afraid. Afraid of what? We're not really told. What we are told is that they were commissioned to go and tell, and what they did was go and say nothing. Why? Why would they say nothing to anyone? Why was that their initial response? I don't know. Why is it that we don't go and say anything to anybody about what happened at the tomb? Maybe the same reasons that they were afraid to go and share what they had seen is the same reasons that you're afraid to go and share what you've come to know. You're afraid of what other people might think. You're afraid of what other people might say to you. You're afraid of what other people might do to you. Will they believe you? Will they think you're odd? Are you going to get mocked? How might you be mistreated? Afraid of not being worthy to share it? Afraid of not being able to properly express it? Maybe feeling overwhelmed, inadequate, under-equipped? Remember, as good as this news was, this was a frightening and powerful experience the women just went through. Like, we, we, we get that. Right? There's a lot of issues at play here, but whatever the issues were, and there were probably many, we're all left wondering is the story going to be told? It's a question that we've got to ask ourselves. What will we say about what happened at the tomb? What will we do with the good news? Say nothing to anyone because we're afraid? Like you have just been given the greatest news in the history of the earth, and you have been now sent and commissioned to go and tell, yet most of us go run and hide. Why? It's incredible news that brings hope 
and peace and life to people who are hopeless and helpless. Like we can't be silent about this any longer. We've been called to go and share what happened at the tomb. The women initially got this commission and the first thing they did was hide and say nothing. What will you do? What will you say? Truth be told, there are only two types of people in this room this morning. There are those who have come to the tomb for the first time and heard this news for the first time that, that in Christ Jesus through his life and death and resurrection that you can have forgiveness of sins, that you can be put back in right relationship with God, that you can have life abundant and life eternal. Like for some of us, this is the first time we've ever heard this, that Jesus' death on the cross pays for our sins, provides us the opportunity to be forgiven before God, and his resurrection raises us to new life, that we could have our relationship with God restored. For some of us, this is the first time we've ever heard this. For the rest of us, we've been to the tomb. We've seen the evidence. We've heard the good news. And we've been commissioned to go and tell the good news that life and hope and peace can be found in Jesus. Two groups, but really the same question this morning. What will you say? And what will you do about what happened at the tomb? Let's pray.